This is Chemistry Podcast 1.7. We're going to talk about the SI system, so the metric system, um, density, and temperature. All right, you need to know with the SI system there are two types of units you can have. You can have base units and you can have derived units. A base unit is just its own unit. It's independent of everything. It's based off of a physical event that happens in the world. Derived units are combinations of base units. Examples of base units, you should copy this table down. Time has a base unit of seconds, length, meters. Mass is the only one that's kind of tricky because it's in kilograms. People want to say grams um, because that just makes sense, but actually it's a kilogram. There's a weight in France that we base all masses off of, and it's a kilogram. And then temperature is measured in Kelvin, and the amount of a substance is measured in moles, and we'll get more to that later. Um, the thing to remember also with Kelvin, though, is it's not degrees Kelvin when you're writing it. It's just Kelvin. So it's like degrees Celsius, degrees Fahrenheit, but it's just Kelvin. Derived units are where we take more than one base unit and put them together. Examples with that are speed. So if I want meters per second, I'm taking a unit of distance, and I'm putting it with the unit for time. And this also works with volume. Volume is in centimeters cubed because we're taking a distance, we're taking a centimeter, a centimeter, and a centimeter and putting them together. So we're taking three distance units and putting them together. This is a derived unit because we have more than one base unit put together. Uh, and later on you'll see uh, how these match up. All right, pause here again, copy down. You only want to copy, though, what is in the yellow. The rest of that is just kind of extra information, but you need to make sure you know prefixes, what their symbol is, and then what it means in scientific notation. All right, giga is huge, really big gigabytes. You hear about that when you think about computers. Mega, kilo, deci, centi, um, milli, micro. So micro, milliliters, nano, and pico. Those are all your prefixes that you should be aware of. We don't use them a whole lot. The three that we use the most are in green here, the kilo, centi, and milli. You may have heard this. This is the prefixes, but we use a saying. So King Henry died by drinking chocolate milk. That helps you remember the six here in the middle. So you have kilo, hecto, deca, base, deci, centi, milli. That helps you remember their order. Remembering that these are the largest. And these are the smallest, obviously. So if you have a tough time remembering the order it goes in, that's a little saying you can use. The reason you want to remember them is because of unit conversions. So we're starting simple. We're starting with just SI unit conversions. So for example, if I have 400 meters and I want to know what is that in kilometers, you can use your King Henry died by drinking chocolate milk. Most of the time, we don't even need these, so I'm going to ignore them for now. I'm in a meter. A meter is a base unit. It does not have a prefix, and it's asking me to go to a kilometer, a kilometer. So what you do is you go one, two, three. I have to jump three times to the left to go from meter, which is a base unit, to kilometer. So I do the same thing with the decimal. And remember, if you can't see the decimals at the end. So this would be one, two, three three with the decimal. So the same thing in, so 400 meters in kilometers would be 0.4 kilometers. You just slide the decimal. All right, so let's try some of these. Let's start by writing our um, prefixes at the top. So we have King Henry died by drinking chocolate milk. We're starting in a millimeter and we're going to meters. Meters is a base unit. So your base units over here can be meters, seconds, liters, grams. Those are really the most common base units. So when you see meter, meter, gram, gram, liter, that's telling you it's a base unit. 
So millimeters, one, two, three places to the left for meters. One, two, three places. And remember, just like with scientific notation, we fill in the extra little jumps with zeros. So that would be 0 .040. We're going from liters to milliliters. Liters is a base unit to milliliters. One, two, three places to the right. So one, two, three places to the right would be 300 milliliters. Centimeters to meters, one, two places. One, two places. So this would just be three meters. Kilograms to grams is one, two, three jumps. So you go one, two, three jumps. So 6,400. We want to take 20 grams into kilograms. Grams is a base unit to kilograms. One, two, three places to the left. One, two, three places to the left. So this would be 0 .020. And then we have milliliters to liters, one, two, three places to the left. So this is going to become even more tiny, one, two, three places. So that would be your answer for that one. And then grams to kilograms, base unit to kilograms, one, two, three places to the left, one, two, three places to the left. That would be your answer. So make sure you have this memorized so that you can quickly remember and convert between um, SI units. All right, we've already talked about density a little bit with the lab that we did earlier, but you'll remember that density is an intensive property. It does not matter how much you have, the density of a substance will stay the same. Its definition is the ratio that compares the mass of an object to its volume. We can say that with an equation. Make sure you have this written down if you don't already. Um, usually mass is measured in grams and volume is measured in milliliters, which is why you're seeing down here that these are the most common units. It's either grams per milliliter or grams per centimeter cubed. This is the more common unit if we're talking about solids. And this is the more common unit with liquids. Although they are interchangeable, you don't have to use one or the other. Um, they are interchangeable. So if we look at this picture, this is showing us how things can have different densities. We have copper atoms and we have aluminum atoms. And you can think to yourself, and if you know, copper is more dense. And you can um, tell that if you have two cubes of the same size, copper is going to have a greater mass. It's going to feel heavier. The reason that is, is the um, atoms are packed closer. I mean, they're still both packed very closely together, but copper atoms there are more of them in the same amount of space. So the more mass or matter that you can jam into a certain volume will make your density go up. So copper's density is greater than aluminum, and you can tell that from this picture, the atoms are bigger, and there's more open space, there's less, there's less matter in this area. So copper is more dense than aluminum. Okay, and we've already done this a little bit when we dealt with the glass beads. If we want to find the density of an irregularly shaped object, so if we take this little robot guy here, if we wanted to find his volume, what we would do is drop him into water and we would use water displacement. So there's no nice calculation you can use in math to find the volume of that man. It's just easier to use a graduated cylinder and see how much the water raises. And if you look at this, remember water kind of forms a meniscus like this within graduated cylinders, within glass. You always want to read at the bottom. So if we're trying to figure out what the volume is to start with and then what it is at the end to find the volume, you'd have to figure out what are each of these little graduation marks? What are their value? So from three to four, there are one, two, three, four. There's five jumps. So this would be three. 3.2, 3.4, 3.6, 3.8, and 4.0. So this is starting at 3.4 milliliters. And up here, it's ending at 5 milliliters. So if I wanted to find the volume, I would just subtract them. And the volume of that little robot 
thing would be 1.6 milliliters. And you can do that with anything. All right, so our question here, suppose a sample of aluminum is placed in a 25 milliliter graduated cylinder containing 10 and a half milliliters of water. The level of the water rises to 13.5 milliliters. The mass of the sample is 8.1 grams. What is the density of aluminum? So we remember our equation. They told us the mass in the problem is 8.1. We have to calculate the volume though. So they said it started with 10 and a half milliliters of water and after we dropped in the sample of aluminum, it went up to 13.5. So to find the volume, we would do subtraction. So 13.5 minus 10.5 is three milliliters. So to calculate the density, I'm just gonna take 8.1 and divide it by three. And I will get 2.7 grams per milliliter is the density of aluminum. And you should be able to check that against a table that has densities of metals listed because we know that the density of aluminum should not change depending on the size of the sample that we used. All right, the last thing we need to talk about is temperature. And these are the three different temperature scales that you have. We have the Kelvin scale, which we said was the SI base unit. It's what we use for the SI system. You have Celsius and then Fahrenheit. Um, it's kind of a rough conversion between Celsius and Fahrenheit, and we don't use Fahrenheit at all. So you use it in your everyday lives, but you're not going to use it in the lab here. We are always going to use Celsius and Kelvin, and there is a much nicer conversion between those. So this is really what you need to work, worry about, is going between um, Kelvin and Celsius. So you can look at this picture, though, and you can see that zero Celsius is the same as 32 degrees Fahrenheit, which is where water freezes, and water boils at 212 Fahrenheit, which is 100 degrees Celsius. So these are pretty nice numbers to remember, zero and 100. And then you can relate that to the Kelvin scale, remembering that zero Kelvin is absolute zero, where all molecular motion stops. So you cannot have a negative Kelvin value. All right, and then looking at this, so we said that going between Celsius and Fahrenheit, you don't need to worry about, so don't worry about copying those down. They're there if you want them. These are the two really important ones, though. So make sure that you can figure out how you go between Kelvin and Celsius. So take a second and write those two down, but we're going to practice them on the next slide. All right, and here's our practice with them. So if I have 150 degrees Celsius, how we get to Kelvin is we add 273. So to go from degrees Celsius to Kelvin, you add 273. To go from Kelvin back to degrees Celsius, you're going to subtract 273. So if I do that, 150 plus 273, we're going to get 423 Kelvin. And see here again, this is not degrees Kelvin, it's just Kelvin. Now I'm in Kelvin and I need to go back to Celsius. This is where we subtract. So you would take 100 minus 273 and you're going to get a negative 173 degrees Celsius. A good way to check that you did that correctly, remember that you should never get a negative Kelvin. So if you ever get a negative Kelvin, you probably did the conversion backwards. All right. Degrees Celsius to Kelvin, we need to add 273, so this becomes 373. And then 40 Kelvin back to degrees Celsius, you need to subtract 273, and you're going to get a negative 233. So make sure you can quickly go between those two. And that's the end of podcast 1.7.